garage. Bubble in, bubble in. Pirate radio. Lord of the mics. We went from like launching it to getting 13,000 people looking at the site. Before people would just make music videos for TV, now they're making music videos for the internet. It was our first year anniversary. We've been working really hard for a year, so we wanted to celebrate that. And then there was a shooting. I was DJing at the party. I've played, done my set, but then I had another set to play. So I've gone, I've left. And then when I've come back, there's police everywhere. And there, there was like an incident with like some type of shooting or something like that. After that happened, it was devastating. Um, everyone was just extremely upset that something like that had happened. And, um, you know, just thank God that Everyone made it out of there alive. Uh, innocent people getting hurt. That's never cool, that's never all right. I think the press made me think, Rah, hold on. We felt terrible as well because our main aim is to always try and glorify all the good aspects of what our people are about and what our communities are about. It in some way tarnished the name for a little bit and then had the, had people having these conversations of, oh, you know what, you know, maybe we're just not ready to have these type of parties and all of this yet. That definitely wasn't helpful. And especially after all those successes we had and trying to put everyone on a high plateau and trying to define what the culture is and trying to show people what we're really like and the positives, that negative was just like, it kind of erased all the good work we did before, and then we had to start again. Can see Tilly. GRM 10 is like a celebration of our last 10 years, but as an album, we've kind of gone back to like our old roots of actually filming the video ourselves, working with like flaming hot talent, talent now. Yo! Yeah, yeah! With Dutch and M. Honcho, Dutch is just one of the hardest out right now, and M. Honcho has been one of the hardest out, and they both have a GRM story, so when it came to GRM 10, thinking about collaborations and things that people don't expect to see. It's almost the courtesy of ours that we can kind of create some of these situations, and that's what happened in the end. Dutch and M. Honcho, burning. Free smoke gonna see you burning. Still cool, I'm an upset learning. Trigger on the dust, too sensitive. Had to tell both take time on the turning. Trick, all right, one more time. Had a look at the Let me go one more time. Ah, ah. Ah, so for certain, it was all drugs and robbery money. The music don't work, then I know for certain. What do you think? I could what change it. If you say certain, yeah. Cool. I was gonna come in saying, because I just keep serving. Yeah. There's one thing that I know for certain. I'm in a trap. I'm in a trap where I just keep serving. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, yeah that would work. I'm gonna do what you're doing. Roads. Oh, 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 give me five minutes. Give me five minutes. I told him, bro, I do it in one take, bro. We're ready to be collaborating. Monday, monster, lost it. Whoa. Anna, Nana, did you do something like that? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, let's go again. Pocket, watching, brothers, Monday, monster, lost it. Whoa. Something like that. I think you should do four and I'll do four as well. How do you get paid money for calling a lot of people to you right now? They hate you. Like, I met a lot of failed, failed rappers. I know. Like, they play me. I don't know why they play me, but they play me. Is this fault, though? No, nah, it is. I'm like, joking. I'm probably joking. Is. What's my fault? There's yeah. a lot of failed rappers. That's not my fault. That's their fault. It's so the greatest fault. So you're going to tell me because there's so many failed rappers, I've made it. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if you're a successful rapper, of course there's going to be failed rappers. Yeah. Well, some people say to me, like, yo, you're, you're, you're like one of the hardest. GRM's um, rappers, and they call me a, G a, a GRM rapper, bro. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I swear to God, I should make a movie about my life right now. Okay, you, see the, you see the case that I just bust? And now that I'm really doing well, and I'm talking shit, got Nick by Scotland, yo, with the fours in Scotland, doing up crime and laughing and that. <laughs> bro, you see with me and the feds? 
Bro, they're doing funny stuff, bro. The, yeah, the license plate. The license plate looks a bit dodgy. I'm like, come on, man. The license plate looks dodgy. Is the car not? No, it's not. Bro, so why do you keep pulling? Bro, they pull him at like seven CID card. And you know what's so funny? I see them coming now. Like, oh, Jam, the other day, yesterday I said to Jam, I pull over the left. He's like, why? I was like, just pull over the left. I just kept my hands out the window like that. <laughs> He's like, like, calm down, mate. I was like, bro, what do you mean, calm down? If I keep my hands in the car, you're going to start making the scene. They're harassing me, host. So yeah, I need you to talk to your friends in the station. <laughs> <laughs> The other day I was driving around listening to um, Dizzy Rascal's album, Showtime, and it's got one of my favorite Dizzy songs on there. It's called Respect Me. When I was listening to the lyrics, because I haven't heard the song for a while, he was talking about how the police or the government or something was trying to blame him for knife, the raise of knife and gun crime. Endless speculation, I'm facing constant controversial relation to gun crime, a garage event with so many claims and no evidence suggesting I'm the reason for the UK gun clap season. For Dizzy Rascal to be saying that in the early 2000s and for it to be a topic now in 2020, it's like the narrative does have to change a bit, you know? Some of the raves that I came up in, they were, they were rough. But, but just, rave, just raves in general, raves of parties in London, urban parties or whatever you want to call them, around that time, something like it was a normal thing, something might happen. It started to get to a point yeah, where anything that like my name was on, it became a problem. Like I said, I went through what gigs and all them went through, like with, with it, where the police were trying to not, not have you play at certain places. In an era of like the Form 696, so in that instance, the police are saying, well, there's gonna be violence at these clubs, so you gotta fill these forms out. It always felt wrong. But at least there was some narrative that they were saying there was going to be violence. So we were contacted and said that basically um, Exxon shouldn't sign gigs, um, that he was a you know a target of various ongoing investigations. And I think the, the call was designed to kind of intimidate us. And also they said, and you can't talk to him about this phone call. And that was the bit that rung particularly dodgy. Because here's an artist. His background is whatever it is, and it's known. And we're talking about doing music together. In my mind, there is no possible issue there for the police or anyone else. With things like that, him being blocked and not being able to tour, people trying to, the police trying to stop him from signing record deals, I just think, like, we're deep believers in God, so we always have faith in God and, like, whatever God has planned for you won't pass you by. He always had that mentality and that attitude, like, you know what, I think you try and shut me down, I'm coming back 10 times harder. Like, I'm not in this for a joke. And then in the conversations we had with him about it, he was just completely open and was like, well, I don't have a very good relationship with the police, so I'm not very surprised they made that call. That in itself was shocking, because it's like, I'm surprised by this call. This should be a surprise. But of course, I'm coming from the outside, so I've never had this type of resistance to anything I've ever tried to do. He was just cool about it and sort of philosophical about it. No, I just knew, like, our thing was going to get big. Yeah. Like, and everyone was going to respect it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it, it had to happen, innit? it? Like, yeah. It was only going to go that way. Because yeah. it's good music, innit? it? What we're talking about here is making records. And that's what we do. And what they're talking about wasn't quite clear to us what, what, what the issue really was. In the moment we're in now, if you're talking about systemic racism, that's probably what you're talking about there. <laughs> Unfortunately, in our scene, we get reminders that we have to stick together. And the reason we have to stick together is because even though we're all very diverse people, Black people ain't the same, yeah? Society gives us blanket treatment in certain areas, which lead to frustrations across our community. Even though we're all different people, we have common problems. The 696 form is a good example. It's like specifically said, if there's a DJ playing electronic music and somebody on the microphone, and I'm thinking, rah, why don't you just say? do a leap off, flipping Ed Sheeran. They're not going to turn up with a deck and a mic, you know what I'm saying? So he can do what he wants, but we can't. I remember getting booked 
and I would just say like, yeah, what's your name? Date of birth. And I'm thinking, rah. Like, what is this? We're just literally giving mad details to people for just to do, just to go and spit bars and get paid. They're able to do it through a legal framework that never ever mentions the word black. They can say that there is a style of music, or there are types of artists that we need to green light. It's arbitrary. You have your little dips into police oppression, um, inequality, areas with kind of like high unemployment rates, but then you also see resilient characters who have managed to kind of create um, economies for themselves. There's a huge conversation to have about ownership, and I think that especially in music that is dominating the charts, uh, we have to look at how that becomes our retirement funds and our investment for our next generations. Just having a bit more voice in that ownership space because I think that when we talk about privilege and race, ownership is the reason that, you know, black culture is underrepresented in so many ways. Like, it's an ownership thing. I started Graham Daily at law school, right? In the first moment I started doing it, I didn't care about law school no more. In college, I got all A's. Uni, I got a 2-1. Law school, I've come. I'm supposed to be like a sick academic, right? I start failing stuff because all I'm thinking about is Graham Daly. You know, you have someone who's done well academically in the past and everything's kind of in order. And then one day you just kind of just don't see him doing anything but coming home, lying on the bed and, and on a laptop. So like, what are you doing with that thing? Why is your room so messy? Why is last week's plate still on the floor? What is this What is this geezer doing? You know what I'm saying? I remember my stepdad came home one day, he opened my door and he said, that's it, get out. You know what I'm saying? I remember I walked to the car park, my mum walked up to me and she said, oh, don't turn to drink or drugs or something like that. That's what she said. I was just there uh, looking at her like, yeah? <laughs> Posty's description of what he did um, when I first met him sounded like my description of what I was doing. We know that we love this genre, this industry, and we want to build. And actually, eventually, everyone started to pull things together. Like, I didn't go to school to learn marketing or anything like that. Um, we kind of picked up a lot of the things we know just being DIY for so long and just having to roll with the punches for so long, getting so many knockbacks and just figuring out cool ways to kind of be seen and be heard because that's what you had to do. You had to get creative. The love for the game and the love for everyone to, to kind of blossom and I think everyone had that passion. You have to understand when we're doing the word presses back then or when Grime Daily initially kicks off, there isn't any money. Do you get what I mean? And it's when you look at who would do what they're doing for free, that's when you understand who cares and who's passionate about it. I was like a manic, 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 manic worker in, in terms of Graham Daly, because I loved it that much, you know? He would, like, drop the footage off it, my mum and dad's, and then just, I'd be editing it, editing it, editing it, and then go to work, falling asleep at work. But I loved it. It, it didn't feel like a chore. That's man are eating great. That man are eating late. late. That's why they're breeding. Ain't, ain't ever had a greasy plate. plate. I got the streets, he mate. Boy, better start speaking straight. And when I say I roll with the dog, trust, trust me, that's I don't mean Nate. I went, I the Jammer and Lethal B beef was like one of our first viral moments. I was having a little issue with Jammer. It was really going down, do you know what I'm saying? It was, it was a real thing that was happening, do you know what I'm saying? They were just cussing each other every day. He come to link me on, I think it was in Walthamstow, chink full of little camera in a car park, and then I was just doing an interview, just talking about some stuff with that Jammer. He'll go link Jammer the day after, Jammer will say something, then he'll come back and link me, I'll reply. It just caught like a mad buzz. He was just like documenting what needed to be documented at the time, do you know what I'm saying? And it was like a new era. It was very, very entertaining, and it was on Graham Daily. So if you hadn't heard about us then, you are just slightly out of touch. YouTube at that time wasn't as influential 
back then, you couldn't really know too much about us. You hear the music, you see us at shows, and that was it. You'd had conflict in the, in the grime game before. With the Jammer and Lethal B one, it was the first one in the UK where it was like, someone said this on Monday, oh, this person said this on Tuesday, this person released the track on Wednesday, that person filmed the video first. Like, you could see it. You're seeing it happening. Almost within a couple months, we were like 150,000 hits, and it was like, fuck, this is big. In terms of running a website, there were like little niggly things that happened, which meant that we were always calling sketchy. Oh, the website crashing was crazy. This is just like an endless battle keeping this website online. And it really started to get pear-shaped when we started having a, a relationship with gigs. He was serial crasher number one, yeah. If I clap it right, blow your back inside, make your face change colors like a traffic light. Gigs threw us a, a couple bones, you know, and every time he threw us a bone, the website's just gone down. Gigs is calling me. People can't watch my video. I probably shouted at him. <laughs> is that? <laughs> yo, people can't watch my video, you know, because I'm like, yo, fam. Sorry, bro. I'm going to sort it out. I'm sorting it out right now. Our phone is sketchy. Sketchy! Get the site back up. Gigs keeps ringing me. I'm, I'm stood in the corner of a nightclub trying to, like, literally in a nightclub with my mates in the corner trying to refresh the server and get a server back up and running on an iPhone 3. Comes back up, goes down again for, like, five, six, seven hours. I'm calling the server company in America. I'm like, my site's down, get it back up, and it's, like, all crazy. I don't even know how to explain it to him because I don't even understand what's going on. And what's going on is I ain't got enough money to pay for the big boy server. That's what's going on. I was on to him. Sorry, puss. From my point of view, I could see the growth of, like, the scene because I'm looking at people like myself that are looking at the website. You know, it's like 30,000 people, 50,000 people, 100,000 people. Wow, there's, like, 200,000 grime fans, you know? It's sick that something has centred everything because at that moment in time, everything was kind of scattered. There was a transition from people doing Facebook or whatever on MySpace, and everyone was trying to find a direct link to find everything. When the digital revolution happened and the levy broke, now we have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bands swimming around our ankles. And curation and having someone do the work is really important. In like the first six months, the independent newspaper has had us in their top 20 music websites in the country. It was like, what? This is crazy. And that's when we started to really see success. I remember sitting in the studio one day, watching GRM. And I remember a period where that was a regular thing. You'd be in the studio, working on whatever you're working on, but in the background, GRM was on. Within the first year, we were hitting a million hits a month on the website, which is, like, massive. So now we could actually film whoever we wanted. We had a football tournament in the first year of launching Graham Daly. Graham Daly, come in. Because basically, what the Graham listeners and fans and supporters want to see is which Graham team won. Yeah, Don't Fresh on. has basically bought his team for about 150, 150 grand. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and put them out on the team. So now, when the tournament's finished now, and everyone, oh, Grime Daily, all right, Grime Daily. Every single rapper and every single Grime MC who was relevant at the time was at that football tournament. I couldn't get that now. That football match that time, it just felt different. You know what I'm saying? Like, we could do it now, but it wouldn't be that. That was the first time I really looked and I thought, wow, we actually, like, are a part of this. Like, they've actually accepted us. It's crazy because, in hindsight, I, I didn't feel like it was anything. I just felt like I'm doing music, I'm doing something I enjoy. And it's only when I look back and I say, boy, that day when we done that, People look at that like this is historical. Yo, cuz, how far are you? Huh? Oh, huh? you're racing. Oh, 
name is Miles Suave. I'm a music video director. This video's based on everything going on right now in terms of the world. Free smoke, gonna see you burning. So go them on oxygen learning. Trigger on the dust, you sensitive. Don't bro, take your time when you're turning. Track came full of your furnace, 24 hours at a Directed many videos gone on GRM. Bangers, straight bangers, holy. Chick on dance, trying to make sure that the phone line's working. See how they wanna ride this wave, didn't see their face when I'm so for surfing. That's the man that's put everything together. I keep on serving. Seven on seven, I served up Martin. Now he's on the flight. All right, guys, let's get the show on the road. From the speed, playback. People are always getting to see my work. People are always getting to recognize my brand. Stop, stop, stop. I shot my first video with my camera. I still do self shoot. Do you know what I mean? That a lot of my videos that you still see now, they are self shot. It's me behind the camera. But obviously we've got shoots like this where it's like you've got the cranes and you know you've got all the lights and all that stuff, do you know what I mean? Freeze when I tell him to freeze. I don't wanna get blood in my jeans. Tell my mom that I love it to pieces. If I dag in my daughter, my it's not a GRM documentary thing. I'm coming for GRM, my own channel. Anti-posty. Anti-posty. Tell Posty if I see him, it's on site. Yo, Post, everything good, yeah? Love, my brother. That's how man they move nowadays, you know, buddy. Everything was going amazing. I mean, we were kind of like in our best form as young creatives. And I guess we sat back and we thought, you know what, to take this to the next level, we need, we need to get an office. So we got an office in Shoreditch, prime location, just opposite Box Park. We went shopping for some um, hardware, so we went to the Apple shop. At that age, all you want to do is buy cars and chains. You don't go spend this much money on computers. We had about 180 pound left, and I was like, let's go out for dinner. We went and had a nice Chinese, slap up Chinese. Very, very exquisite. I only used to go there at Christmas usually, but it felt like Christmas that day, so we've got some scallops, we've got some lobster, even a bottle of champagne, actually. When you know you're trying to live, you're trying to do something. I was tipsy. I was feeling on top of the world. My Blackberry was dead. I put the charger in, turned it on, saw about 98 missed calls, thinking, what's going on? Then I saw various messages talking about your YouTube's gone down, so I thought this might have been a glitch. I phoned Sketchy to ask it, see if he could fix it. He's like, Sketch, Sketch, the YouTube's been shut down. Like, wh what's happened? What do you mean, the, like, the YouTube's not gone? How, how can the YouTube's been gone? You know, like, you're logging, you're doing the rounds. So, OK, cool, it's the password. You log in, you log in, and it's not working. It's not there. Like, what's, what's happened? It was gone. All the history was gone. Everything was just gone. I don't know why, I just thought it was a joke. I also didn't understand the magnitude of what that meant. It was like you've taken away one of our lifelines that brings this music and this culture to the world. Fucking hell, it seemed like the world collapsed, didn't it? <laughs> like, I just remember it was like, whoa, like... It felt like no one was safe. Like, it felt like if that could happen to Graham Daly, no one's, no one's safe. All I know is that it lost a few of our videos. I just thought it was a hoax. I remember just calling Posty, like, you know, what's going on? What's happening? I had all these angry rappers hitting me up, talking about how all their videos had gone. It was peak for a lot of men, do you get what I'm saying? Like, even to this day, like, I'll feel the effects or see the effects at least. Sometimes I might try and draw for something to go and look back on. It's not there no more. For a little while, you think your whole world's gone, bruv. And then you wake up after five minutes and you're like, wait a minute, that's their man's YouTube. I still remember those phone calls to this day. Everyone was just calling till everyone stopped calling. Graham Daly, it, it just felt like it carried too much bad history. We were like in this war room, like, what the fuck are we gonna do? Out of nowhere, Link Up TV popped up. So wait, we're not even second no more, we're third. Bruv, we were depressed. 
Oh, I'm just vaping yeah, here. Ready, ready. Because of the smoke thing. I always vaping it. Okay. It'll be alright. <laughs> I want to look the most comfortable that I live on 140 grams straight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking like, to me. Yeah, yeah. 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 Me. I'm hearing it. Yeah, just here. Um, where do I look? So, who am I looking at you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my driver's all turned up in there. I'm not going to watch it. Say, driver, it's just my brother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sound special. <laughs> Oh, we started. <laughs> <laughs> nah, no one ain't let me know. <laughs>